Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone. Just welcome you to another 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We're on lesson number two, God's grand Christ-centered plan as we journey into the book of Ephesians. I think Paul, I referenced this the last Sabbath School panel, Paul and John are my two favorite authors in the New Testament. So I am excited about this journey through the book of Ephesians. Last week, we kind of did an overview of the book and this week we dive into Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 14. I want to introduce my family here on the set, your family as well. To my left, Brother Daniel Perrin. So glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I have Monday's lesson, which is costly redemption and lavish forgiveness. Mm, that Lovely. sounds good. In the middle, the lady with a beautiful blue jacket, Miss Shelley Quinn. Glad you're uh, here. Thank you, sister. I have Tuesdays, which is the same uh, uh, title as the overall arch overarching theme, God's Grand Christ-centered plan. Amen. Brother Ryan Day, evangelist and singer in Israel. So glad you're here. Amen. Always great to be here. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled, Living in Praise of His Glory. Amen. Amen. Last but not least, my pastor, Pastor John Lomacain. And I have the Holy Spirit seal and down payment. Oh. I enjoyed this lesson. So that's Amen. Thursday. I'll be waiting. I'll be gleaning. <laughs> I love it being on Thursday because you get to hear everybody as they go down the table. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure, let's pray. Loving, gracious Father in heaven, you've opened this door for us to walk through. We walk by faith, and not by sight. We've done what we pleased our hearts to do by studying and preparing these notes. But without your power, Lord, it's of no value. Mm -hmm. Send your Holy Spirit now to communicate through us to those who are watching and listening. And may Jesus Christ be glorified, we pray mm -hmm. in your precious name. Amen. 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 Dr. John McVeigh did a great job with this quarter um, and these lessons. We look at the opening to Ephesians. We're looking specifically at Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. And the lesson called it a majestic thank you note. Other people say this section is praise and worship to God in Christ. But you know what Jill calls this section? This section to me is the reminder of who I am in Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anytime I start to falter, anytime I start to question, anytime I doubt who I am in Christ, I go back to Ephesians chapter one and I discover who God says I am. Uh, many years ago, I did a uh, young woman's retreat. It was a teen girls retreat. And um, at the start of the retreat, I said to the girls, I said, why don't you write down, this is anonymous, people are much more honest when they're anonymous, write down one thing that you wish you could change about yourself. And I actually kept this, this is many years ago, all these years later, this is just a couple that I brought. Uh, this is one girl, insecurity, selfishness, judging other people my inability to love and trust other people, my low self-esteem, fear, hate, anger, wow. my heart. This one just says, I wanna change my life. Wow. These were teen girls, the issues they wrestled with, the issues they struggled with. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're gonna discover as we walk through the book of Ephesians that all of us are dead in trespasses and sins. All of us were there, but we don't have to stay there. Amen. In Christ, we discover who we are. It changes how we view other people. It changes how we view ourselves. It changes how we think. It changes how we act. It changes how we love other people. It changes how we forgive. And those interpersonal relationships Anytime you forget who you are in Christ, go back to Ephesians chapter one. Mm -hmm. uh, our memory text is Ephesians one, verse three. You can turn there with me, Ephesians one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Sunday's lesson, we look at chosen and accepted in Christ. And I have four of those verses. We're looking at Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6. 
And in that section, Daniel, we're going to look at seven things we discover. We are in Christ from those four verses. Before we do that, it's interesting to me that you really see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit present in these verses. We see God the Father in verses three through six specifically bestowing on us His grace through His Son and adopting us as His children. We also see the Holy Spirit. We'll see that present in verse three. We see the God the Son, I think Daniel's gonna cover this, the redemption and forgiveness in verses seven and onward. We see God, the Holy Spirit, Pastor John's gonna cover that. The Holy Spirit seals those who believe and provides the guarantee of our faith. So who am I in Christ? Here's seven things that you are in Christ from these first few verses of Ephesians chapter one. We pick it up in verse three, in Christ, Thing number one, or uh, identity characteristic, you could say number one of who you are, is blessed. Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. That word spiritual comes from the original Greek word pneuma, which is spirit. We use that to reference the Holy Spirit. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in heaven. Christ. Takeaway number one, recognition of who we are in Christ comes through the Spirit. You know, we can read the Word of God, but you don't really understand what it's saying to you. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction, right, of sin, righteousness, of judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches and instructs. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who um, woos us, you could say, to Himself. So we are, recognition of who we are in Christ, it only comes through the Spirit. In Christ, we are blessed. Let's look at the next thing we are in Christ. We are chosen. We're going to the next verse. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world. I love that, mm -hmm. Shelly. It reminds me of your favorite verse, yeah. Revelation 13, verse eight, right? How the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. I don't know about you. Were you ever chosen last for anything in life? Some people aren't very athletically coordinated and maybe were chosen last for a sports team. Maybe some people aren't very musically gifted and they're chosen last for some sort of competition. Maybe some people aren't as intellectual and maybe chosen last on a debate team in school. But in Christ, we were all chosen. Ooh, I love that. In Christ, we were all chosen from before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? Takeaway number two, he didn't choose us because of how well we performed. He chose us from before creation because he wanted us because he loved us. If that doesn't tell you your value in Christ, I love that. I don't know what does. In Christ, we are chosen. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've been. In Christ, you can be chosen. Let's look, keep going. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy mm -hmm. and without blame before him in love, that word hagios, that word for holy is hagios, meaning sacred, holy, or set apart. Mm -hmm. Christ set you and I apart to be holy. He chose us to be holy in him. Takeaway number three, we don't try harder. We don't grit our teeth. We don't try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. He sets us apart to be holy in Him. He called us to be holy, not by our own merits or our own efforts, but through the infilling power of the Holy Spirit. He called us to be sanctified in Him. And in case we forget, okay, in Christ we're blessed, in Christ we're chosen, in Christ we're holy, it's reiterated in Christ, number four, we're blameless. Not just holy, we're blameless. We should be holy and without blame, before Him in love. That word without blame in Greek is derived from two words, meaning not and blemish. Literally meaning without spot, no blight. The Strong's Concordance says this, without blame, without blemish, faultless. 
It's the same Greek word used in Jude, verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you, what's the word? Faultless. faultless. The same Greek word, faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So God calls us to be holy and faultless before him in love. Takeaway number four, Christ is able to perfect our sinless characters and make you and I like Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Shelley would say. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. First Thessalonians 5, 24, faithful is he who called you, who also will do it. Right. In Romans 4, 17, God calls those things that are not as though they already were. Oh, I love that. Let's look at the fifth characteristic in Christ. We are predestined. Now this word we get hung up on some, sometimes, Seventh-day Adventists, we say, wait, wait, wait a minute, we don't like to use the word predestined because that means only certain people are predestined to be saved and certain to be lost. No, that's not what it's talking about. Ephesians 1 verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. Paul is not saying that only certain people can be saved. He's very clear in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. Not just certain people that he's predestined ought to be saved. No, he wants all to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if he wants all to be saved and all to come to repentance, what is this talking about? Paul is saying that God made provision before the world was even created for all sinners, that's you and me, to be restored to divine favor, to be adopted as his children. Takeaway number five, from before creation, God made provision for you and I to be predestined to be saved. He wants everybody to be saved. Not only that, number six, we are adopted, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You and I are not children of darkness. We're light in the Lord. We're not sold under sin. We are set free by the power of God. We are not enslaved. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. Takeaway number six, adoption by Jesus Christ gives you and I freedom, rights, and an inheritance. Mm -hmm. Finally, number seven, in Christ we are accepted. We're in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Remember sin brought separation from God. When Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter three, sin brought that separation from God. Jesus came to reconcile, we see this in 2 Corinthians 5, 18, to reconcile the world to God. In other words, he bridged the gulf so that you and I could be accepted in God. God. Takeaway number seven, our final takeaway, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice makes us accepted in the beloved. So in Christ, we are blessed, chosen, holy, blameless, predestined, adopted, and accepted. That Amen. is a great list. Thank you, Jill. I am Daniel Perrin, and uh, I have Monday's lesson, Costly Redemption and Lavish Forgiveness. This quarterly is literally taking us verse by verse through Ephesians, and this brings us to verse seven of chapter one of Ephesians. A picture is worth a thousand words, they say. If you see something, you can understand it. First Peter chapter one, verse 12, Peter talks about prophets who shared the gospel message. They taught it through the Holy Spirit. And then he adds this phrase about the gospel, things which angels desire to look into, yes. that there is something, a picture that they want to see. And so with one word, Paul sometimes paints a picture for us. He does that with the word gift and justification and sacrifice. But here in Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8, he says, in him we have redemption mm. through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Now, everyone back then, they knew exactly what redemption was all about. We've got to go back in time a little bit to get a picture of this word. If you were in paradise and you were enjoying it and the weather was good and the birds were singing and someone came and ripped and dragged you out of there, you might not be too pleased. <laughs> but if someone dragged you out of slavery, 
that would be different. And so everybody in ancient Rome understood the life of a slave. It was illegal to formally marry, no control of your education if you could receive any, no physical mobility, no upward no mobility, no sideways mobility, no plans for the future, private ownership, no privacy for that matter, no right to object no freedom of conscience, bodily autonomy, no access to medical care. And so there are those who have estimated that up to 20% of the Roman Empire, even more so in the city of Rome, were slaves. And there were people who uh, suggested if we could have all the slaves wear an identifying uh, garment, well, that idea was nixed because then they would realize how many other slaves there were and, and perhaps they would revolt. In fact, archaeologists have discovered that there are, they've, they've dug up uh, metal collars with riveted tags on them to identify a slave to prevent them from escaping and, and to give instructions to return them. And so this then becomes an illustration of sin, slavery. And you could be born into slavery, and we find that in sin as well, born into a sinful nature and the consequences of sin. But you could also be conquered, and that happens to us too. An enemy intrudes, and a friend in grade school, they share a picture with you, or a song with you, or, or a relationship with you, and suddenly you're conquered, and it's been downhill ever since or something shows up on a device and all of a sudden you're conquered. Redemption is the experience of having your freedom purchased from slavery and that's what everybody then understood. Paul talks about this in his book uh, to Philemon about the runaway slave Onesimus and listen to what he says in verse 15 to 18. He says, receive him, receive the former slave, receive your runaway slave forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother. In other words, mm -hmm. let his slavery go. Receive him as you would me, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. In other words, let me pay and make him better than a slave. We often use this word interchangeably, redemption with salvation, but it's a specific picture. There's two New Testament words. One of them is agarazzo, which is the price that is paid to redeem a slave, what it costs. And we find this in Revelation 5, 9. It says, you're worthy to take the scroll to open its seal for you were slain and have redeemed or purchased us yes. by your blood. But the word Paul uses here is apolutrosis, which uh, focuses on being delivered from the old manner of life, the change to a new life. We read about it in Titus 2, 13 and 14. It says, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us mm. from every lawless deed. Redemption here is a before and after experience. Your life goes through a change. You're redeemed from sin. That, that literally before you were in shackles of guilt and shame and now you have forgiveness and peace and something changes. Redeemed from total darkness, which is ignorance. Maybe you didn't even know there was a better life. There were, didn't know there was another option. Unaware that the patterns of your life were following worldly customs and slavery to sin. Redeemed from servitude controlling habits, deeply seated habits from which you are helpless to extricate yourself and somebody, something more powerful has to come and pull you out. Maybe you've been there and maybe you're there right now saying, I'm stuck. I need somebody else to redeem me. Redeemed from worldly traditions, worldly examples, worldly comfortabilities. We've been flowing along with what we call a normal life or a new normal. And it simply is the, the normal of slavery to sin, the world's slavery. Well, how are we redeemed? Because there's a price to redeem a slave. And the cost for us, it, it's not money. It is a substance. It's blood. And on the one hand, blood is biohazardous waste that, that could be discarded, and some people do that with the blood of Christ. On the other hand, blood is a valuable, prized possession, not a possession, but you think about it. Uh, if you have AB positive blood type, you can receive blood from anyone, but if you are O negative, well, then you've got to receive blood from somebody who has O negative blood, which is 7% of the population. And so that blood is precious. It's valuable. The price of redemption, our blood takes us to the foot of the cross, to the blood of Christ, because he has good blood, 
we have tainted blood, polluted, diseased, infected, contaminated, dirty blood. And if I, if I were to go give blood, at the end of that, that experience, I could take a, they give you a little sticker, two barcodes, one of, and they're, they look identical. One of them says, don't use this blood. You could put that on there saying, my blood is not good. All right, for whatever reason. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold and silver. Some people say invest in gold, it's good. It's corruptible, we know it. All right, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, that's an inherited diseased blood, but redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus himself is the only true universal donor when it comes to blood because we Amen. need a very Amen. specific kind of blood. That's right. right. It's got to be perfect mm. in the likeness of sinful flesh, but sinless. Mm. We need blood that, that adds up to something. And Jesus, his life, when you, when you add up the value of every human life lived throughout eternity, the value of Jesus is still greater than that. Yeah. Mm. The life of Jesus is not just a document, Jesus of Nazareth, identification number, no. Eternal unity with the Father and the Son, that is worth something. The one through whom the Father created all things, that is really worth something. The one who is the image of the invisible God, that is irreplaceable, unmeasurable, both Son of God and Son of Man, that is a treasure worth counting on. Yeah. That's right. What parent, if they received a ransom note, would not literally liquidate their entire fortune and pay what was required. That's what God does. Matthew 10, 28 says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom yes. for many. That word ransom is lutron. It's related to it. It's, it's the same derivative of that word apolutrosis because lutron is the price that was paid to redeem the life of a slave. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus give when he gave himself? the redemption price, right. and he did not begrudge the price, and he did not resent the cost. In fact, there's rejoicing in heaven when that cost is paid over one sinner who repents. And repentance then brings us full circle to the before and after experience of what redemption is, because we live out, we have to live out what God is purchasing in us. He makes the payment but we have a choice. God doesn't just want to in, improve our condition in this life of slavery. Uh, he starts there, he starts there, but he goes somewhere different. The goal for God is a total change of my loyalty yes. because yes. I have a choice in my redemption. Romans 1 verses 18 and 19, such a powerful verse here. It says, having been set free, you became slaves of righteousness. There's that word again. All right, you've been redeemed from slavery to become slaves of righteousness. He says, so now then present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. This is God's work in us and for us. This takes us to that great song. It might be dangerous to break out in song, so I won't do it, but redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Hmm. What a great song and the ending words of that song, his child and forever I am. God's right. redemption lasts. Amen. Amen. I love that. Thank you so much. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one. We're going to kick it over to Shelley Quinn and Tuesday's lesson. I'll tell you, you all laid a marvelous foundation and it's just so inspiring to get into the book of Ephesians. And as you said, anytime that you feel a little downhearted, just get in and start claiming all of these promises. My name is Shelley Quinn. I have Tuesday, God's grand 
Christ-centered plan. Let's begin with Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. And Paul wrote, just as he chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 1, 9, that God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, mm -hmm. but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. time began. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, he talks about the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Hmm. When we talk about the gospel, it's the good news. Revelation 14, 6 talks about the everlasting gospel. Hmm. It is the everlasting, the everlasting good news that God planned before he created us. Hmm. When God created a perfect universe, a perfect world, a perfect garden, perfect people, He operates by a government of love yeah. and choice. Sin entered into His sphere of righteousness. It fractured the relationship between God and man and between man and man. But you know what? It didn't catch God by surprise. Before he created the world, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you say, how can one God be three persons? God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not one plus one plus one, but one times one times one equals one. The Godhead got together and they decided one of them would come down and take on our flesh and pay the penalty for sin. Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Philippians uh, tells us that when Jesus Christ came down, He was God. Mm -hmm. He took on our flesh, laid aside everything of His glory. But what the Bible tells us is that the, the goal of the everlasting gospel is 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ right. Jesus. Right. Jesus Christ, my favorite verse, Revelation 13, 8, is the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. He introduced a substitutionary sacrificial system in the garden. He introduced the everlasting covenant in Genesis 3.15. And God has only ever had one plan, and that plan is that all would be saved through righteousness by faith. And righteousness by faith has two aspects. He delivers us from the penalty of sin, but God also through Christ delivers us from the power of sin. Right. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, I love what Paul is saying here. He's introducing God's plan. He labels it as the mystery of his will, his purpose, and a plan for the fullness of all times. What was God's plan? Mm -hmm. He's going to unite everything, everywhere in Jesus. And if Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, he says, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, mm -hmm. notice that's plural, in the fullness of times, he might gather in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth. Mm -hmm. So Paul's announcing that unity in Christ is the grand divine goal for the universe. And what we see is this, when he says mystery, it's not a secret. Hmm. It's just that it wasn't fully understood in times past. Mm -hmm. 
What you see is the everlasting gospel is introduced in Genesis 3.15 and it progressively unfolds throughout the Old Testament and each generation understood a bit, understood this. You know, prophecy is never fully understood until it was fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So this all, this, this universal unity, there were stages of development. It's all adding up to the big reveal of Christ Jesus when he came. So Paul's just one of these excited voices that gets to announce this. And he says in Ephesians 1.18, he says, oh, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling, as you so perfectly told us, Jill, is that in Christ, we are new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. We have all of these blessings in Christ. We have all the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. He says in Ephesians 2.13, 2, 12 and 13. He's speaking to them. He says, you know, once at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, that everlasting covenant that God put in motion before he created the world. He said, you had no hope. You were without God in the world. But now in Christ, he's speaking specifically to the Gentiles. You who were once far off have been brought near mm -hmm. by the blood of Christ. You've been reconciled with God. Jesus is our peace and he wants us to be reconciled with one another. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body, mm -hmm. one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Jesus is the center and circumference of our faith. That's right. He is the center and circumference, the supreme hope of the church. When he, Paul says, this great plan is the unity of all things, all believers, we need to look around and say, how unified are we? Are we fulfilling God's great plan in the world? He tells us that God is going to win the great controversy. That's right by overcoming the evil of earth's time. Right. He says in Ephesians 1, 9, making known to us the mystery of his will, his plan, his purpose, that is in accordance with his good pleasure, his merciful intention, which had previous, he previously purposed, set forth in him. He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages to unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and on earth. I have to read what uh, Pastor John McVeigh wrote because this is beautiful. He says, in this way, the church signals to the evil powers that God's plan is underway and their divisive rule will end. Division right. is sown by Satan. Mm. He says this, the Bible says, the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. But he says the last half of Paul's letter opens with this passionate call to unity. He continues with a lengthy exhortation to avoid behavior that damages unity. Please listen to God's heart. God doesn't want us to be divided. He said instead, it is to build solidarity with, uh, with fellow believers. And he concludes this rousing image of the church as a unified army. We cannot beat Satan at his game until we become a unified army participating with vigor in waging peace in the name of Christ. Mm. Amen. Amen. And thank you so much, Shelley, for the beautiful lesson. I have Wednesday's lesson. My name is Ryan Day. And uh, the lesson is entitled Living... I'm going to say this a little slower because it just helps to 
really comprehend what it is we're studying. Living in praise of His glory. I think it's sometimes we need to slope things down and just comprehend what it is we're studying. Because in this case, we need to learn to live in praise of His glory, not our own. And, uh, you know, the lesson brings out, and I'm not, there's a large chunk of this that I feel we've already somewhat covered. There's a lot of repetition, and that's great because repetition is a great teacher. Uh, but having been through these particular verses here in, in Ephesians chapter 1, the lesson brings out that, uh, you know, Paul reached a point where he recognized that Ephes the Ephesians had basically lost a clear sense of who they were as Christians. In fact, even in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, talks about how they had lost heart. And so he's trying to awaken them back to this concept of who they are in Christ. He's, he's trying to help them understand their spiritual identity in Christ. We see that word, that phrase coming up many, many times, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. So that could be kind of the, the theme of this whole book is Paul saying, you're in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. All of this is in Christ. And so, uh, and of course he reminds us uh, here that their lives as well as our own should shout the message of Ephesians chapter one, verses three through 14, which we're gonna read a couple of these verses, but they've been covered very clearly up to this point. Uh, but, you know, Paul really, uh, in this particular lesson, we're going to hone in on what he teaches and what he brings out in terms of our inheritance mm. or God's inheritance. So this inheritance concept. So not once, not twice, but three times in this particular passage of Ephesians chapter one, uh, much like the in Christ passage, this comes up three times. Inheritance, inheritance, inheritance. So he, he wants us to focus in on that. And so what I would like to do is start with Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. And then we're going to go read Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 uh, and specifically verse 14 there. And then we're going to read verses uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 through 18. And we're going to hone in on verse 18. So verse 11, 14 and 18 is what we're focusing on. And I'm going to read verse 11 here. This is Ephesians 1 11. We read it already. But it says here, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So in him also we have obtained an inheritance. All right, what does that actually mean? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. Now let's skip down to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14. Uh, 14 is what we're focusing on, but we're going to read it in context with verse 13. It says in verse 13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then it goes on to say in verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance right. until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. I love that. We're going to come back to that. Now go on to Ephesians chapter one. We're going to read verses 15 and we're going to set up for verse 18. So it says, therefore, in verse 15, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in many, excuse me, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. And now verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Did you catch that? So the lesson actually is bringing out, and it asks the question here, compare the uses of the idea of inheritance in, in these three verses. And, and what is it that Paul is, what, what's the big idea that Paul is trying to communicate here? Well, the lesson actually brings us out, and I love this because when you read further down in the lesson, this is what Brother McVeigh brings out very clearly. He says, have you ever received an inheritance uh, uh, as a result of someone's death. Uh, this is a reality in life, right? This happens. Uh, perhaps a relative left you a valuable treasure or a considerable sum of money. In Paul's view, by virtue of the death of Jesus, Christians have received an inheritance from God. We see that in verse 14 very clearly. But notice this, it also, it also says, and become an inheritance right. to God. And we see that clearly in verse 18, but even he goes on to uh, suggest that even verse 11 suggests this as well, because it says in the Old Testament, God's people are sometimes thought of as being uh, at his heritage. And we see this, uh, uh, you know, in terms of an inheritance in Deuteronomy 9 and Deuteronomy 13. 
32, as well as Zechariah chapter 2. It says this sense of being or becoming God's inheritance is clear in Ephesians 1.18. We just read that, that it seems like it makes it very clear that we are God's inheritance. And it's like, what? How, what does that even mean? And it is likely the meaning of the term in Ephesians 1.11 as well, which would then be translated, okay, a little bit different than what we read earlier. It says, in him we have become an inheritance. So as a central element in their Christian identity, Paul wishes believers to know their value to God. Like this is the, this is the main point here. Who are you in the Lord? Be reminded that you're just not some, some random speck in the universe. You are God's. He, you are not, he has not only given you an inheritance, but you are his inheritance. That's right. That's right. And therefore the final message brings about that they not only possess an inheritance from God, but they are God's inheritance. And so, uh, you know, the message also, uh, the, the lesson brings that, that I thought was a great question. You know, what is the difference between working to get something and inheriting it instead? You know, when you think of, uh, of inheritance, you know, I, you know, my father has discussed this with, with, uh, with uh, me and my siblings many times. Uh, he's still a young man and I believe he's going to be with this I believe he's going to be 100 before he dies. I don't know. But uh, I, I have faith in that. He's still a healthy young man. And, but he has had that talk with us. He's conversed with us. And he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave you something. I'm, I've, I've already you know, made it clear in my will and, you know, w what, what I'm leaving behind. But it's interesting when you think of that inheritance, I don't deserve it. It's, it's all the works of his life, what he earned, what he worked, worked for, what he established. But when that's left to me, I didn't earn it. It's, it's not something that I worked hard to get. Uh, I inherit it. Uh, uh, and so uh, the lesson brings out, how does the idea uh, help us understand what we have been given in Christ? And it brings back the idea that we are in his inheritance. We have received this inheritance. We're unworthy. We have not worked. We haven't earned it. How are you going to earn an inheritance that Jesus Christ has accomplished, right? That Jesus Christ has completed. And so Romans chapter 9 verse 16, as I was studying this through, there were a few texts that popped in my mind that really helped to communicate this idea of the importance of understanding uh, the difference between working for something and inheriting something. Romans chapter 9 verse 16, what does it say? We've read it many times. It says, so then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. The very concept of this is the foundation of the gospel. And that is that Jesus Christ has, has, uh, has bestowed upon us His goodness. We receive it freely, His grace freely, not something that we earn, not something that we will or that we run to accomplish, but because He has bestowed that mercy upon us freely. Also, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of His uh, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We've already established that from the foundation of the world. We were on his mind because of his love, because of his compassion, because of his mercy. He bestows this upon us. If we, just, if we simply just receive him, if we surrender our will to him, it's not something that we earn. Jesus stretches out his hands on the cross. He says, I love you this much. And I know you can't see all my hands hands and arms in the camera here, but I'm, I'm literally touching Shelly and Pastor Loma. I love you this much. And it's like, how are you going to add to that? What can you do to that? And that's the purpose here. God loves you so much that he, you are his inheritance and he has bestowed an inheritance upon you. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You did nothing because you can't add anything to it. It's because of his love. Right. Galatians chapter two, verses 20 and 21. Love this text. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But then verse 21, okay, what does it say? I do not set aside for the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Is the law important? Yes. Are the commandments important? Yes, it has a functional foundational aspect in the gospel plan of salvation, but we do not work or earn our way. My friends, when are we going to get this? And when are we going to get this. We got to get this through our head. It's not, it's not about what you do. Right. It's who you know and who you know right. changes what you do. It's all about what he's done and our acceptance of that and our surrender.
surrendering of that. It's not about what we do to earn that. It's his inheritance. We are his inheritance. He bestows it upon us freely because of his compassion, his love, and his mercy. I'm getting excited as you can see. It's a passion of mine. It's the gospel. It's the foundation of the gospel. And we should, as the lesson is entitled, live in praise of not our glory, but his. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. Wow. I get all of the sum total of all of this inspiration. Thank you for delivering Thursday to me, which is the Holy Spirit seal and down payment. We're going to begin with Ephesians 1. Let's start here. And thank you, Ryan, for reminding us and every one of you. Uh, I still just can't get that in Christ out of my brain from that last lesson study. Thank you so much. And, and all the methodical walking through and Shelley, your passion is always there. But this continues because what this lesson is about is not what we've studied, but what the Holy Spirit has done through each Amen. one of us. Mm -hmm. That's why I like this lesson study on Thursday. Ephesians 1 verse 13, in him you also trusted. Mm -hmm. Notice who we trust, not us. We trust Christ. Mm -hmm. And how did that trust get activated? After you heard the word of truth, yes. do not discount truth. Yes. So many people uh, don't pay attention to the word truth. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm wa working on a sermon, Ryan. Whatever happened to the truth? Right. It has become a word that has been downplayed and become a byword. It seems mm -hmm. like if you mention, come our church teaches truth, people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And so they're selling experiences nowadays instead of n realizing that our salvation has already been purchased. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy something that has already been purchased. Jesus Christ has purchased our salvation, but he doesn't omit the truth. And it continues, the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed, not only having the truth, but believe it. And it says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And I love verse 14, who is the guarantee? Mm. You know, when you get a guarantee, you hold that. When you buy mm. something that said, now there's a two year warranty, there's a two year guarantee, mm. hold that. Do you want to buy an extended warranty? Love the way you said it, Daniel, in Christ, we have an extended warranty. <laughs> the blood never loses its power. <laughs> Thank you that. for that. Yes. It's the purchased blood, the precious blood, the spotless blood, yeah. the non-tainted blood, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the day we walk through the gates into that new Jerusalem, and then we are covered by the perfect righteousness of Christ to the praise of his glory. All of that in verses 13 and 14. And Paul brings out three very highly important points that I want to bring out to you. Notice the first one. The Holy Spirit works on us. He does what? Works on, works us. on us. What's the purpose? To make us a believer. That's called, he delivers me. Then the Holy Spirit works in me mm -hmm. after I become a believer. And that is after delivering me, he develops me. Yes. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit works through me to attract others to become believers. And what is that third D? To display me. Mm -hmm. First, he delivers me develops me and then displays me. Mm. And that displays oh, okay. in Matthew 7, let your light so shine. That display is not to attract others to us, but to attract others to Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. The praise and glory is His alone, not ours. If you are gifted in any capacity and you've been sidetracked by allowing the praise to come to you, I think today is a good day to recalibrate the purpose for that gift. God does not give you a gift. And I love this statement. I say it wherever I go. I will never use God's gift to rob God of his glory Indeed. because the glory is not yours. It's the praise of his, his glory oh. that makes the difference. So those three things, deliverance, development and display. That's what the Lord wants to do. But then also the other parts of the Holy Spirit is first authentication. Let's go to Luke chapter one, verse 35. And you'll see this authentication in a way that you probably not understood it before. I'm going to take a passage that applies to a specific character in history and shows how it's not an exclusive passage, but an inclusive passage. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit authenticates us. Listen to this. Luke 1:35. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Okay, now, didn't Paul say Christ in you, the hope mm, of glory? That's right. This was a passage we know applies to Mary in exclusivity. 
but applies to every one of us in inclusivity because we cannot have Christ in us unless the Holy Spirit overshadows us mm -hmm. and the power of the highest is developed in us. So the Christ that is being born in us is another aspect. He's placed there. That seed, if that seed remains in us, we're not just delivered, we're developed and then finally displayed. The seed is planted there by the Holy Spirit, developed by the Holy Spirit. So we are safe to be put on display. A person that is not developed by the Holy Spirit is not safe to be Amen. put on display mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they think the glory is theirs like the sons of Sceva. They think the glory belongs to them. Mm -hmm. No, but the glory belongs to God. Right. That's the authentication. Luke 1 verse 35, validated by Colossians 1 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That cannot happen without the work of the Holy Spirit. Next thing, the validation. The Holy Spirit validates the excellence and veracity of the gospel. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5. The Holy Spirit validates the veracity, the excellence of the gospel. Mm. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in what else? Power. In power <laughs> and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Mm. I love the way that Paul the Apostle said, you know about me. So this gospel couldn't be just about me. So don't let the gospel be about you. If you, if you present yourself, show your frailty, but never present Jesus Christ as the reason why, well, let me just rephrase that. When you present Jesus Christ, don't present his frailty, present his glory. That's Always right. your frailty. I would say, if you hear something messed up in the sermon, it's me, any glory, always belongs to God That's because right. the Holy Spirit validates the excellence and veracity of the gospel, which in fact is Christ. And we are only included by the power of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, which is the third part, the empowering authentication. Let's go to Acts 1 verse 8. First, the authentic authentication about the Spirit being planted in us, the validation of the power in the gospel, and then the empowering transaction that is done by the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You know, we can't be witnesses of Christ in a validating way until the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Now, what does that mean? That's where the power lies. The gospel, the Bible is a book of power. It's the book that breathes, I believe that. But you can take the book that breathes and make it a book that you present but when you allow the book to be presented by the Holy Spirit, the power is far greater mm -hmm. than you can ever imagine. That's right. It doesn't come in the ecclesiastical communication of your, of your, of your, uh, your, your um, vocabulary, but it comes through the transmission of a life that is being radiated through you. Thank you. And I want you to understand that when the Lord lights you on fire, nobody will miss it. So don't try to light your own fire. Be the bush that seems to be insignificant but you're not being consumed, you're being ignited for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. I want to be an insignificant bush. I will burn not to be consumed, but to simply display the glory of God. And that yes. can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So Paul, the, Paul brings out two points that uh, Dr. John McVeigh identifies. He also points out the, these other aspects, the ownership that the Holy Spirit reminds us of. Look at Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. And I'll read this in the interest of time. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Anything God touches, anything God builds, anything Jesus Christ is connected to is moving in the seal of That's perfection right. direction. And the wisdom we get is the wisdom of God. When we stand before God in perfect beauty is the work that the spirit of God has done through us. But notice the seal of perfection. That seal is not only ownership, but that seal is also transaction. It's transactionary. Mm -hmm. What transaction? Let's go to Jeremiah 32, verse 10 to 14, and let's see if I can get this in there. Verse 10, mm -hmm. and he speaks about the transaction that takes place when God is involved in the process of developing, delivering, and displaying us. And I signed the deed and seal it, took witnesses, and weighed the money on the scales. So I took the purchase deed, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And it goes down all the way then to verse, um, verse 12, and I'll read simply the latter part. In the presence of the witnesses who signed and 
the purchase deed. And lastly, verse 14, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take this deed, both this purchase deed, which is sealed, and this deed, which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last many days. Now, I don't know if you caught that. Mm. We're the earthen vessel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're the cracked earthen vessel. Right. When the Lord seals us and signs us, he puts that deed in an earthen vessel mm -hmm. and it lasts there for many days. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many days only the Lord can determine, but all the work that is done is being done by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, that is incredible, Pastor John. Thank you. Deliver, develop, and then display. I love that. Thank you so much, you and Ryan, Shelley, and Daniel. What an incredible study. I want to give you a few moments to share a final thought. Well, we don't have slavery as they did in ancient Roman times, but some of you are struggling and suffering in slavery to sin, things you can't overcome. I just want to encourage you that there is a, an incredible price that was paid for you. You are valuable. God's grand Christ-centered plan was developed before he created our world. Old Testament saints were saved by righteousness through faith, looking forward to the coming Messiah. We are saved also looking back at what he accomplished and up to our high priest in heaven. Mm. This, this lesson has brought those words, that great Andre Crouch song. Yeah. The blood that Jesus shed for me. You know it. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never, never lose its Ah, that's the gospel right there. Wow, mm -hmm. wow, mm -hmm. praise the Lord. Ryan, since you included that to me, I'll just turn the time over to Jill. <laughs> <laughs> praise God for that. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. Isn't that incredible? Thank you all so much. I always love it when you sing on the set and I'm glad to have a duet today. Uh, join us next week. We're still in Ephesians chapter one, finishing out Ephesians one next week, which is this incredible prayer. Uh, Ephesians one and Ephesians three, Paul prays for the believers. We'll be studying this in detail next week, the power of the exalted Jesus. What a gift is ours and the gift of Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I just want to appeal to you right now, make a choice. Open up your heart to Jesus. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not push that invitation aside for another day. Today is the day of salvation.